Okay, great. So here's the official welcome. Um, thank you all for being here today. This is really exciting for, for everybody involved. Um, I am Lauren Smith, as we've determined, and so are all of you, apparently. Um, but no, in, in seriousness, my name is Lauren name Smith, is Lauren. And, and I am one of the um, co-founders of the Taos Abstract Artist Collective, along with Aliyah Horlein and Carrie Bell. And, and we are um, tech, but as we call ourselves, the Taos Abstract Artist Collective. I'll, I'll read a little bit to you. I don't have this memorized yet, I should. But the Taos Abstract Artist Collective promotes abstract artists working in or near Taos, New Mexico towards the exchange of ideas, new aesthetics and creative concepts. Taos is synonymous with abstract thinking with origins in indigenous geometries, transcendental and modernist movements and conceptual and land art installation. Once the nexus for westward bound artists, Taos unleashes expansive abstract thinkers represented amongst TAC and represented amongst the TAC artist group are established mid-career and emerging artists who show in Taos or Northern New Mexico nationally and internationally. So that is our um, sort of our working mission right now. And we are going to start. So by way of a uh, sort of briefer introduction, this is the first of our fall series, the TAC Talks. It's our interpretation of what a virtual artist talk and studio visit could look like. Um, and we are doing things a little bit differently, so I'll explain that in a minute, but we are delighted to welcome Paul Benke, Tau Space Artist, as our first artist of the series. Paul, will you just say hello to everybody, and we'll all welcome you virtually to the stage here. <laughs> Hi, I'm coming to you from sunny Taos, New Mexico, and um, I want to thank everybody for, for logging in. Um, I think it's going to be fun, and it's great to see you guys, and and thanks, Lauren and um, Aaliyah, uh, for having me. Thanks so much, Paul. Fantastic. Um, I have a couple of thank yous as well. I want to thank Mark Smith, our videographer, our sort of official tech videographer, for helping us with, with this program and for coming up with a lot of these ideas. Mark has been a great member of the tech community and has filmed a lot of artist content for us, which is really wonderful. Um, and thanks to all of you, really. This is a um, this is a community-based initiative, and and people have asked us, you know, do you have dues? What is it? What is it to be a Taos member? And we've said, uh, or a TAC member rather, uh, you are you can self-identify as a um, as an abstract artist living and or working in or near Taos, New Mexico, and those are that's the criterion for membership. We don't have membership dues. We will, as we have different shows, ask for um, submission fees and we're growing. And all of this is a little bit of an experiment, but a good one, um, a fun one. And so to that end, what I'd like to share is um, the format of today. So just to give everybody a little bit of orientation to where we are on planet Earth, what we're doing here, um, we are going to do something a little bit different than some of the virtual artist talks that perhaps you've listened to or tuned into in the past. Um, we have created a pre-filmed conversation between Paul and myself. I visited Paul's studio a couple of weeks ago with Mark, and we had a lively conversation about life and art, and we filmed a short, kind of made a short film about that. It's about 26 minutes long. Um, I think a little long in the future. They might be a little bit shorter, but we had a lot to cover. And then after that, we will pivot and come back as our group for Q&A. So this is an invitation for all of you as you're tuning in. Hopefully this takes the pressure down for everybody here in this space. Um, if you have a question that pops up about Paul's work or practice or about the uh, Taos artist community or tech, feel free to jot that down and we'll have an opportunity to ask questions or to put questions in the chat. If you'd rather um, put a question in the chat, that is great. Um, and I think, you know, I think that is everything. Um, so we are going to, again, I'll ask folks to respectfully mute yourselves um, and not talk over the, the video as we go through that. And if you have any um, specific questions, you can send us an email. So um, shall we get started? I think so. All right, perfect. So I'm going to do some techie things right now. So bear with me. Hopefully we'll take about under a minute.
So some of our artists tuning in um, or community tuning in are from the Taos area, but I imagine a lot of folks that are tuning in are from all over because you've lived all over and worked all over. So I'm hoping that you can share with us a little bit about, um, you know, kind of take us uh, up to date of, of how you landed here in Taos and where you started. I know you, you're born in Memphis. Maybe, right. Um, take us through the steps here. Okay. Well, I was born in Memphis. Um, moved away from there probably when I was around 20. Um, I was involved in theater and things like that first. And then I, I, but I went to a creative and performing arts high school mm -hmm. in Memphis. And so I majored in painting there. And um, so all, all through those years, I just kept painting and painting and painting. Um, let's see, I uh, moved to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and that's where I met my wife. Then we ended up moving to Dallas for a little while, and uh, we lived in Florida, um, New Jersey, New York, back in Memphis. And uh, so uh, right before uh, COVID happened, we had been living in New York for about 10 years. Yeah. And we'd been talking about Taos uh, since probably the early 90s when okay. we first met and got together. And uh, I think we were, were reading too much George O'Keefe letters and things Where, like that. We, Where did you find that reference? We wanted to be, uh, you know, uh, Alfred Stieglitz and George O'Keefe. And uh, I guess I would have been O'Keefe because yeah. I'm, the, I'm the painter. But... Uh, uh, so anyway, we, we thought now, now we might as well, we never yeah. did make it back then. We never did make it out to Taos. So we said, if we can go anywhere, let's try Taos. And we found uh, an apartment for rent online and just signed the lease and then moved. And wow. um, so here we are. We've been here about maybe a little over two years. How is your work contemporary right now for you in the moment? Okay. Um, well, my work is based on, well, I think one of the few ways forward in abstraction right now, when almost everything is so permissible, um, is to almost, to almost think of um, painting as like poetry, because you're going, you're going inward a little bit, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you also want to be connected to, um, you don't want to be so insular and so inward that nobody else can, can, uh, can uh, rip feel anything from it. So my work starts, it's a very process driven abstraction. It, it kind of always has been. It uh, incorporates a lot of imagery that uh, sometimes is obfuscated, sometimes uh, kind of played down, sometimes played up um, of imagery from pop culture, uh, imagery from even from like the occult, from the subconscious, um, the s different symbols and things like that. And they just get all thrown into that mix. And what I try to do is just kind of stay open to a flow when I'm painting. And hopefully all of those interests and things that I'm, that I'm reading about and looking at will somehow kind of filter their way into the work. Sure. That's my, that's my hope, um, you know. Um, I don't think that it's necessary to know about all of those, what all of those forms are or images are or whatever to appreciate the work because I think it is, it can be looked at as a process-based abstraction. Um, and then there are people, I, I do come across people that do recognize different things in it, you know, that I was thinking about or that I, uh, that I included. Um, so that's always great when somebody uh, picks up on those on those things, but I don't think it's really necessary. necessary. So but. as you're speaking, one of the things that comes up for me, and we've talked about this before, is you know the um, impact of the un unconscious or subconscious mm -hmm. on a creative process or on a thought process, uh, or on you know on on um, a theoretical framework or philosophy or something like that. Right, right. So it sounds to me um, that you know, a lot of the things that maybe are a little bit more under the surface and you reference your, your upbringing in mm -hmm. a fundamentalist context, right, right. right? in the yes. deep south uh -huh. and pop culture influences of that time, how they find their ways into our own, maybe less conscious narratives. And then mm -hmm. those get externalized through the work. Um, and so I, it resonates with me as you're talking about that, that we don't actually need to know the right. answers before we go into the process. And then, yeah, Afterwards, I wonder how, to what extent you 
notice new elements that even were, you know, not completely conscious to you in the, while doing so, or, you know, while assembling that new things that emerge or new questions or new symbols that might emerge in your mm -hmm. work um, that were previously a little bit below the surface. Right. Yeah. I think uh, oftentimes I don't really, I don't really know exactly what I'm doing until I see a body of work. And then I see an image or a, a shape or a form that um, is repeated. Yep. And uh, so then I start thinking, what is it? What is this? What does it mean? This kind of reminds me of this. Maybe it's connected to that. And so I kind of can 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 build, uh, but it's usually after the fact right. when I when I think of those things, like what this image really is or what it means. Um, and it's always been that way in my painting. I feel like. There's a, it's a, um, it's a detriment for me and, a, and almost a block if I, if I try to say, I'm going to make a painting about this. Right. So I, I never pick a colors. I, ne I never sit down and say, okay, I'm going to use these colors in this painting. And here's my little tests and studies for those colors. And I've never done that. I've never, I mean, it just, it just starts. I just start putting marks on the canvas and then usually, um, putting layers of thinner paint over over those and scraping them down. Um, I find once you put that kind of uh, screen, that, that kind of film over the marks, it kind of makes them more cohesive. Okay. And then you can start to see, uh, I can start to see relationships better uh, on, for the composition or for the forms. And then so I just, you know, start capitalizing on some of those and then uh, do the same thing again, scrape it out and uh, go again yeah. and so there's a it's a big um it's a big uh kind of back and forth between um thinking about sitting there and really thinking about it and think oh this needs a thinner patch of color here or this needs pink here or whatever and then also just while i'm working just doing it and, and sure. letting it happen and then then coming back and saying, okay, now what do I need to tweak or do, you know, differently or... I mean, that speaks to having a lot of trust, I think, in yourself in the process. Thinking about, you know, what it's like to be an artist just starting out or an artist with a body of work and a lot of mm -hmm. experience as you have, you know, to be able to trust yourself that things may happen on the canvas that were not anticipated right. or that might be you, what you would call a mistake or, you know, something that you need to change, but trusting yourself and trusting that the work has its own maybe message to, sh to communicate with right. its audience. Right. I, I used to, I used to kind of shy away from that kind of that way, that way of thinking. Cause you know, you hear people say, Oh, I didn't paint this. Right. This came through me. And, right, right. and I was like, no, I went to art school for four <laughs> years and worked my ass off, sure. you know, and I did this, <laughs> you know, can it, it, would, be both, it wouldn't be here. Be both? I think the, I think it can, I think that it's kind of like, what I, I, I prefer to think of it in like, um, like dreams, like, um, you know, they're, they are there to kind of tell you something maybe or make sense of, help you make sense of some things, but they're still part of you. It's still your, your brain, your experiences that are recycling those things or jumbling them up or whatever. So I kind of think of that uh, with, the, with working on the painting too, that, that it may come from something that I'm not really conscious of, but it is still me inside oh, there somewhere, percent. you know? So I, I never think that, oh, you know, the Lord Jesus is working through me right. or, you know, whatever. It's always just like, it's always me. Well, we disassociate <laughs> ourselves from our less conscious parts. And, and in reality, our less conscious parts are, you know, make up the majority of who we are and how we walk in the world. Right. So right. there is no separate, I mean, from my perspective, there's really no separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was really thinking about just your ability to trust that what you do have as part of yourself, yeah. part of your own ethos or your, um, you know, your own points of reference in your practice, mm -hmm. um, come together as they need to, or that you trust that, you know, you have what you yourself actually have what it takes to put, you know, the painting together or to mm -hmm. put the piece together in a cohesive way. Yeah. I think I, I don't know if it, 
I don't know if it's, uh, I just try to like almost like be a blank when I'm, when I'm putting stuff down on the, on the canvas. Yeah. And so, because I think anything that I try to, when I try to start thinking, oh, this is wrong, I should do this, I should do that, at that stage, it just blocks, it blocks everything from, from, from flowing. And um, yeah, I think you just have to, uh, it, it's hard to trust, it's hard to trust that though, it's still hard. I mean, I've been painting, I don't know how long, but it's still hard for me. And even though I work that way, where you have to trust that a painting is going to come from this, right. you know, and they, because I look around a lot of times when I'm starting a new body of work and I see uh, these paintings around and I think, well, obviously I can paint a painting because here it is, but how did I, right. it happened. how did I do that? It, I, yeah, I have to trust it happened because I'm looking at it, but, but it's just, um, you know, it's like, it's so hard to say, okay, now I'm, I'm going to make a painting now, right. you know? And so that's why I think that I can't think about the, that stuff. I just have to start working and doing, mm -hmm. and then that eventually that will, something hopefully will tie itself together. And usually it's not until like the very end where a form starts to, like a lot of these, these imagery, mm -hmm. like with these kind of um, abstracted wing mm -hmm. forms, that, at least that's what they are in my mind, mm -hmm. um, were based on um, images of, seraphim seraphs that i was yeah. that i was thinking about like with the what do they have like six or eight wings yeah. um and i was doing a series of abstract paintings that kind of um all of a sudden one day i thought this looks like um uh ezekiel's wheel um you know this this image well you know the the story of ezekiel and uh seeing the kind of the like this kind of um prophetic vision and almost a little bit armageddon -y. Okay. you know, uh, he saw the, the four creatures, uh, uh, the ox and the book of revelation. -ish. It's, I don't know. I think it's in Ezekiel, <laughs> Ezekiel. but, uh, but it's, but it's very similar to that kind okay. of thing. And, uh, you know, he sees the wheel and okay. the, these, uh, kind of, kind of creatures. Um, and, uh, so one of the forms that I had that started coming up in a, in a, in some paintings reminded me of this kind of wheel, this Ezekiel's yeah. wheel. So I was doing some paintings based on that. And then I started getting interested in reading about seraphs and seraphim yeah. and those kind of things. And then I think those, those things kind of started, I was like, oh, that looks like a wing or this looks like this or that. And, but, but where I was, where I was going was that it takes probably all, but around the last 85% and then an image will click in I and see. I'll say, oh, that's what this painting is gotcha. about. That's what this is. And then it's very easy to finish the painting after that. Right. But before, up and getting up into that eighty-five percent is a struggle sometimes. Yeah. Um, Could you just? It just seems well. I mean, yeah, I'm sure you know. It just seems like all paintings, like we're in the mid phase, they just all look like look horrible. Yeah. And um, you know, uh, so you think, oh, this is I can't, obviously I can't paint. Obviously, I'm never going to paint another painting again. But then somehow you get over it and get it's over that hump. Internal it. dialogue, though. I think I've heard a lot of artists talk about that. You know, and mm -hmm. there is that sort of awkward stage, or I experience that in my work. Well, I've done a lot of work, and where, mm -hmm. like, what is happening? How is it coming together? What does it look like? And right. I think maybe a lot of people might walk away in those moments. A lot of abstract artists that I talk to are asking a question, whether the question is completely obvious to them or not, but mm -hmm. solving for a question in their work, whether that's through the materiality or, you know, maybe more of the thematic content that you're talking about, whether right. that's rooted in, um, you know, uh, various ideological frames, religious frames, philosophical frames, mythological frames, you draw mm -hmm. a lot from mm -hmm. myth and folklore and religion and pop culture. Um, right. You mentioned TV in the 80s, so I'm also an 80s. Yeah person that would like to know what TV you're referencing. That's, oh, TV. But, but you know what I mean? Like there's a pull. So right. even with possibly like more commercial work, who knows what that person's pull might be to right. create, but right. there's like um, something that is a compulsion or mm -hmm. of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly when you're immersed in a series of work or body of work and one piece can inform the next, I think mm -hmm. that's truly evident. Um, I see that. I feel that <clears> in your work and, Although, you know, visually they might read very 
differently, they obviously are parts of a whole. And so do you feel like being here in Taos, you've, you've created a, like a discrete body of work or, or is it more experimental, do you feel like? I don't necessarily think of it as experimental. I mean, like I, like I said, after all, it is just process-based abstraction at the end of the day, which people have been doing for, you know, decades. Um, so I don't, I don't really feel like it's experimental. Um, I feel like all my whole trajectory as a painter is just getting closer and closer really to who I am okay. and that, um, it, the newer paintings just build on the, the older paintings. Like, if you look at my paintings from the early 2000, 2008, something like that, they're much different than, than they were. They're much more minimal um, than, than these. But I feel like they have, they have, I've never like sat down and said, I'm, all right, now I'm going to stop making minimal paintings and I'm going to start making more crazy painterly stuff. Um, it just has evolved over those however many 30 years or whatever it is. Um, and there are like little changes each mm -hmm. time. And now we get here where, where, where I am. Um, so I don't, I don't really know how to explain that other than the fact that it's just working, yeah. that it's just being in the studio and, and doing things. And then also like, um, for a while, when I first started painting seriously, I didn't want, I wanted only formal references in the work. I didn't want any personal references or any, anything like that. And then I started, uh, some figurative elements started coming into what I was doing. And then I started thinking that I'm, deni I'm denying myself, like, like, because of all those things you were talking about that influenced me as a kid that I was interested in, um, the, the religion, the TV, the uh, pop culture, all of that stuff. It's like, that's part of me. I read, I, I read people, Ma you know, I mean, people magazine or whatever it's, it's, or watch Buffy the vampire. So it's all, it's all in there yeah. somewhere. And, uh, if I am trying to block that out and say, no, I'm only making, um, minimalist paintings and they're all formal. And that's what I'm interested in that. It's not doing a very good job really of, of, of presenting me, my, personality or my m mentally or anything or answering your question or answering any questions and I think that 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 that's what good work comes down to that yeah. it's like reflecting the artist it's telling you something about the artist um, and uh, that that to me is the goal that's where I think if I have a goal that's what it is but it's still kind of out there somewhere and kind of vague. And, and that's one of the things I love about abstraction is because you, you don't know what your work is really gonna look like in five years or 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, when I was doing figurative work, I felt like I was kind of uh, doing paint by numbers after a right. while because I would do these, all these drawings in different poses or different still life setups. And then I would pick the one that I thought was the best and then I would do color studies and to give a mood to the piece or whatever. Sure. And I just felt like I was just, after I had that drawing done, I felt like then it was just all filling it all in. And I know that there are incredible figurative painters that, that aren't doing that. I mean, they're, they're, they're making incredible work, right. but for me, that's what I felt like I was, that's what I felt like it was right. for me. And so I, I think abstraction just because of the just because of the fact that it's just like wide open like yeah. when I first started to make an abstract painting and I was looking at a blank white canvas I was like what do you do you know I mean because like, you can do anything okay. um, and so I think limits are very important too that's how I made my first abstract paintings was really limiting the forms really sure. limiting the blacks and whites taking out all color Okay. Um, just so that I had these rules and restrictions to operate within because I couldn't do it if I just thought I can do anything. Right. Uh, it just didn't work with my personality that I could, you know, I could even start, you know. Well, it's a little bit of a, you know, the dichotomy of, of disabusing ourselves of what we learned in art school. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, and being able to 
create our own parameters. Yeah. So we have parameters that are set in a formal training environment as you've received, you know, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. we, as you're describing, we, we create our own parameters that might be the launching point into the work yeah. um, and figuring out how to reconcile that tension. I think it's really hard for so many folks. And, and uh, a lot of artists that I've talked to over the years talk about sort of the unlearning right. of all of the things that we've learned mm -hmm. about form and composition and, you know, the technical aspects, yeah. especially particularly, you know, more abstract or, or um, you know, abstract gestural painterly painters mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. losing some of that, uh, the formal element yeah. piece. It's, it is diff it's difficult and it's, I don't, I can't really explain it. Like I can't really explain why, I would be depressed if something I'm doing like this is not working. Yeah. Because it's just putting paint on a canvas. That's really all. I mean, right. that's what I'm doing. And so why is this like, why am I in a bad mood? You know, <laughs> or, or nasty to uh, or nasty to friends and family because this isn't working right. Sure. You know, I was I was watching. There's a there's a John Hoyland. One of my favorite painters is John Hoyland, a British uh, abstract painter. And they did a, a film of him, I think it was in the late 70s or early 80s, and it's called Six Days in September. Okay. And he was saying that it always, he always thinks it's funny when someone says, uh, oh, painting is therapeutic, I just feel so good. Like if they're having a problem, they sit down and do that. Because he said, I think, the, <laughs> I think one of the best ways to drive someone crazy is to get them to start painting. I mean. Because, it, it, and I think, I guess it's just a different way of looking at it, but... I look at it that way and it just drives me nuts. Like for me, I guess because ego is, is involved, I think I'm trying to make a great painting here. You know, I mean, I don't, I know it, I know it won't be. And I know uh, that, I mean, like when, I, when I'm, when I'm comparing my work to, uh, you know, the painters I admire right. in history or whatever, sure. I think, uh, a friend of mine told me once, uh, you know, that, that you should, at least that should be your goal, is to uh, to make work as good as your heroes, you know. Okay. That you may never do that, you probably won't, but that should be something that is, that's your goal, because that's your competition, really, if there's a, such a thing as, and I like the, I like the, that kind of competition in art. I don't think that it's, it's good to have a kind of a competition where, you know, you're like, my work is better than all these other, but I think if you're sharing a studio with somebody and they're working a lot and getting a lot of good work done, that makes me want to work harder and get better work yeah. done. Well, that's also, that goes back to what you were asking about, um, about basically making art in Taos. What does Taos offer? Sure. Um, and one of the things that it offers me is um, kind of a, a respite from from New York, from that way of thinking and that way of hustling and um, networking and all of that. And, and, and because you don't have all of those things going on all the time uh, that, are, that are constantly pulling, pulling at you, um, you can really focus and you can get into your studio and you can go a little deeper maybe uh, because you're concentrating more on your own work sure. than going to someone else's show or networking or writing about somebody else's exhibit or something like mm -hmm. that. And that's one thing that, that I think a place like Taos um, affords really well is it affords that, that opportunity to just kind of hunker down and, and yeah. um, you know, and think, okay, now I'm just gonna think about my stuff for a while, yeah. you know. You know, in your artist statement, you talk a lot about your references growing up in the deep south mm -hmm. and that you're we've talked a little bit about this throughout our conversation but the parts that sort of work their way into both conscious and unconscious or subconscious mm -hmm. aspects of self you know you are there are there i guess on the more conscious side of that strong memories or recollections or experiences from your earlier life um, that you carry with you in your studio work today that you'd like to speak to I think a big, a big thing, uh, a big something that stays with me uh, is kind of the religious upbringing, but there's kind of been a spin on that because my, I was raised um, a, a good part of the time by my grandmother because my mom was a, 
a single mom for some time and then she was working and things like that. So I spent a lot of time at my, my grandmother's house. And my grandmother was a little bit, she was very religious. A lot of people in her family were schizophrenic. I don't know that she might have been a little bit herself. Um, she did things like automatic drawing, okay. uh, automatic writing. She was into religion, but almost in like a supernatural, okay. more supernatural way, like with Ouija boards okay. and things like that. And so that just kind of, when I think back about being a child in that environment, it just seems like soupy to me. Like, I mean, you're in this mm. soup and it's, and because it's the South, it's like steamy and hot and humid and scary. Southern Gothic. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, I mean, because I spent a lot of, <laughs> listening to my grandmother talk about that stuff, I think I spent a lot of time as a kid scared, you know. Sure. Uh, uh, I remember, like, you know, we would be watching, like, In Search Of, the old TV series with Leonard Nimoy, mm -hmm. and they'd be talking about ghosts or mm -hmm. some monster or something that was, uh, and, you know, I'd be watching from behind the door jam, you know, trying right. to trying to see it. Um, uh, so that's something that kind of sticks with me. And so that's kind of a very, that's kind of a very peculiar um, mishmash of yeah. the religious upbringing, fundamentalist upbringing, but then also in a way, this kind of supernatural weird stuff too. Well, it's all weird. <laughs> but, but it asks the question, or it sort of begs the question of like, what's real? What's not real? Does right. that matter? And when all of that shows up in your work, because you are pulling from, I think, literary, religious, mm -hmm. mythological, um, you know, philosophical sources, mm -hmm. they all kind of occupy their own reality together. Right. So you, you get to determine that, mm -hmm. which is probably, you know, without getting into any analysis here, is right. probably different experience than your younger self that's looking through the door right. Jam could have done, was trying to make sense of it. It feels in a way that you're... You know, you allow a space or create a space in your in your work for all of those elements to coexist. And maybe that is maybe that is still trying to make sense of it. Yeah, maybe make, make sense of an upbringing somehow, or influences, or yeah. you know, uh, in, through the work. It's been really lovely to have a glimpse into your process and and your thought process and your inner artist life here. So. Well, it's it's great to have you here, and uh, you know, uh, you. And the, the, the abstract group has, has brought a lot to my immediate uh, you know, understanding of the community yeah. and, uh, and, and life here. And so I really do appreciate that. And, uh, you know. Uh, We're really glad to have you here in the community. <laughs> and so nice to connect the dots here in Taos, um, if not in New York City. Definitely nice to be here and to see your work and um, just to hear more in greater detail. So thank yeah, you well, so much. it's hard to shut me up. So you'll, you'll hear whether you like it or not. Well, I'm sure we'll you'll hear something. we'll have an opportunity <laughs> to have um, questions from folks tuning into our Tech Talk today. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for, for today. Thank you. Yeah, Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Okay, here we are. We're back. Um, thank you, everyone, and hope you enjoyed watching a little bit of a tuning into uh, the inner workings of Paul's studio. Paul, I'm going to pin you um, onto the screen here. Um, I think I did that correctly, perhaps. And I am going to ask you, Paul, if you wouldn't mind to give us perhaps just a bit of a statement, you know, here you are. You, This is the first time I think that you've seen everything, you know, in the conversation as well. I wanna give you an opportunity to share a little bit and then we'll move right into questions. So if you've thought about some questions as we've gone along, fantastic, um, and we'll do that. So Paul, I wanna bounce it over to you right now. Well, gosh, I, I first of all, I just have to say, I say a lot of incredibly profound things. So thank you all for being witness to that. Um, and thank you for recording it, Lauren, because I'll forget them all later. But uh, so yeah, I um, I don't know. I just um, so what were you? So what? 
would you like to, uh, what would you like to know is leading into those questions? Hopefully. We can jump into questions for sure, uh, but we really appreciate you opening your studio up. So um, oh, thank you. Thank you. yeah, it's been wonderful. So I would love to, you know, folks have, if you'd like to speak a question out loud, raise your hand to via the Zoom hand raising icon, you're welcome to be formal in that way, um, or put a question into the chat. I want to open it up now to folks. Um, I see a lot of people have popped in, great. Um, any questions that you might have for Paul about anything you've watched or that's inspired you as you've tuned in? Can we oh, just- there's Siobhan, is that right in there? Okay, fantastic. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello? Where's Siobhan? Perfect. Has that worked? It's, yep, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay, I'm terrible at Zoom. I just wanted to say Paul's fantastic and I love him and it's just great to see him, you know. And this is a fantastic picture he did that he gave my daughter a few years ago. And I just think he's amazing. Thank you, Thank you so much. That's very sweet. It's nice to see you, Siobhan. I've got two screens operating back and forth. So if you have your hand raised, um, please, uh, and I don't call on you, please speak up. Uh, I think I see in? Tom's yeah. hand and then Graham. So Tom, maybe will you jump in and then we'll pop over to Graham sure. perhaps? Sure. Um, uh, I wanna ask um, Paul, uh, while you're developing a painting, cause you explained that you it's process, so you're not sure where it's going to go. I'm just curious, just at the end of you, what you were talking about, you spoke of being frightened as a child um, by things that were going on in the house. And I wonder if while you're painting ever, any of that, um, is there, does anything come up in the painting that might revive a little bit of fear, not necessarily the same fear you felt as a child, but, um, is your work always going along pleasantly, I guess is what I'm asking, or is, or those like you, you talked about peeking around the door and looking out. And I'm just wondering if that ever happens when you're alone in the studio and your painting is the thing you sort of want to peek around the door at. Um, well, I don't, I've, you know, I've, 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 I've gone over and over and over in my mind um, and in therapy and things like that, these, these, uh, my, <laughs> my, my past. So not a lot really surprises me or scares me um, really when it shows up in a work. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it is important uh, to be open though, to, uh, so that you, so that you do can respond to what you see. Um, I think that in my mind, when I see imagery in the work, um, I do see some of those things that I think, um, you know, either scared me or, or as a child. Um, but I look at most of that stuff now, like when, you, when I think of um, even, even the stuff growing up uh, where I was thinking or being exposed to more kind of interest in the supernatural and things like that. I I I I tend to frame that more in in a in a with a lens of uh, looking at it through a lens of pop culture, and so I think it does distance me a little bit from those from those kinds of things. Uh, maybe that is what keeps me from. Maybe that's what uh, keeps me in the room <laughs> in front of the canvas and uh, and painting. Um, but I, that's a very good question. I, I really uh, I I'd like to think about that a little more. Thanks so much, Tom. Appreciate that. And I'll bounce over. We'll bounce over to um, Graham. And I had forgotten to ask folks, and I wanted to do this because I realized we may have folks internationally tuning in. Here we are in New Mexico on Mountain Time. But if you would say your um, actual name and not my name and where you're located and space and time, planet Earth, that would be fantastic. I appreciate it. So, Graham, over to you, please. Thank you. Uh, Linda and I are located in Anchorage, Alaska. So um, my, that's my other half in her studio. But uh, one of the things that you both said that I thought was was quite poignant, and I, I certainly connected with, was that unlearning what you'd been taught at art school. 
because I used to I, I used to joke that it took me 10 years to unlearn what I'd learned to art school to actually allow me to start doing what I wanted to do. And that, that raises, I mean, I'm a university art professor. And I feel sometimes that what we're teaching students, because I think all art is process orientated. And that's one of the things I really do like about what you do, Paul. It's I get the sense that there's an awful lot of free fall that it's an incredibly courageous approach towards making work. And then at a certain point, as you say, things coalesce. But when we're teaching students, we're actually teaching them that, you know, there are processes, yes, but we put work together. We actually construct it, we compose it. And it feels in some ways that we have to, because without that training, without learning for one of a better term, the rules and the laws, we don't know how to break them successfully. But um, thank you. I, I enjoyed uh, hearing what I've always enjoyed talking to you and enjoyed seeing the work. Uh, I sent you an email this morning. You need to t talk to me about getting a show up here. Oh, great. Okay. But thank you. Thank you both. And thank you for setting this up as well, Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I, think, uh, I think that, you know, you just can't. I think with your with education, your education, I think you just can't get away from that. I think you just can't away. I think that um, all of the stuff you're learning, and you're learning about so many different artists, so many different techniques, and you and and you're experimenting so much in school that I think it 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 gets you maybe farther and farther away um, from yourself, really, because your your concentrate your your concentration is outward. Um, and for instance, in my painting classes, I, uh, we, you know, we had those, I'm sure everybody has those all day long painting classes, painting one, painting three, whatever it is, subject and context. Um, and I always preferred to have a studio off campus. Um, and I, luckily I had an instructor who would come to my studio off campus and kind of give me a critique or, and then of course for our group critiques, I was back. But when I tried to paint in a big classroom or the open studios that we had at my school with surrounded by all of these other people, I just kind of froze up. I had to get away by myself and kind of try and calm down and focus on that stuff. And I'll focus on what I wanted to do. And it wasn't easy. And um, I think, you know, you said 10 years. I think it took me about five of painting almost every day before I started doing anything that I was remotely happy with after school. And that's just, I think that's just the way it is. I think that's just the, what's something we all have to work through. And, uh, and, you know, I think it's good for us too. You know, I mean, it's good to be exposed to all of those things. I mean, that's why I, that's why I went back to school um, at a later age was because I thought, you know, my, my development, I, I thought I could, could accelerate my development on my own um, given enough time, but I thought it would take a lot longer than if I just went back to a, um, a, a, a concise, consolidated four years and, uh, and just worked through that. And uh, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't abide the idea of the cost or uh, being under the, the structure of a grad program. So I never did, I never did go to grad school, but I made it through those four years of undergrad and I'm, I'm glad of that. Thank you so much, Paul. And thanks, Graham. I, I'm, you know, we won't take a, a poll, but I bet a few of us in the room might ha have some uh, feel, relatable feelings. Um, I see uh, Deborah with a question there. And then I'm gonna pop over into the chat because I see a couple of questions in the chat, but Deborah, um, not Lauren Smith, Deborah in the red turtleneck, please jump in, thanks. Hey, thank you, Lauren and Paul. Great job so far. Uh, so I have a question uh, more about the present moment. Um, Paul, you spoke about kind of enjoying this time in Taos out of the rat race. You've abandoned me. I live in New York and our friendship goes way back of uh, when Paul lived in the city. So now that um, you know, Taos is giving you this time to focus more deeply on your work, 
Um, I'm also curious, are there, are there sort of, for lack of a better term, sort of trends in the art world that you have always been sort of keeping an eye on um, that you enjoy doing that feed your practice and how, if indeed that's so, how are you doing that now? Or do you miss it? Or is that also something that you've kind of let go of if it was something you were doing, watching other artists, that kind of thing? I think, yeah, I think, um, well, I think predominantly now the way I do that, the way I kind of stay in touch with the things that I, that I respond to is largely through social media. Um, you know, there are things like um, James Calm, the painter Lauren Monk has his videos that he goes and videos tons of shows in New York City. And that's a really great thing uh, to kind of keep in touch with what's going on. Um, there have always been, um, I have, I would say predominantly been um, inspired by the painting that's going on in Brooklyn. You know, I spent a lot of time, as you know, in Brooklyn, um, a lot of um, my studio was there for years. Um, there's a great, great painting community there. Um, so I'm constantly looking at painters, um, they know that are coming out of that scene. Um, uh, I love painters, uh, you know, the, the biggies like Chris Martin and Kathy Bradford and those, but, and also, you know, um, some great painters, Ben Pritchard, uh, I look at a lot, I like his work a lot. Um, it doesn't necessarily, um, relate, you know, visually, um, to my work, but, uh, I think the attitudes, uh, inspire me and I relate to those attitudes. I relate to that. Um, it's, it's very funny because when I first moved to New York, um, Sharon Butler and Raphael Rubinstein were talking a lot about a, a um, kind of a, a wave of painting that was going on and they named it casualism, uh, new cas the new casualists. And at the time, it's, it's funny, at the time I wasn't really into it. I was, I was too kind of, uh, um, what do you say, serious? I thought, oh, this is just, uh, you know, they're not even trying, they're doing all of this, you know, on warped canvases and how, how, how long does it, act, how much trouble is it actually to have a straight canvas to stretch your, your canvas on, straight stretchers and stuff like that. I didn't really respond to it, but I think uh, as the years went on, um, that has become, uh, at least in a way, a sort of an influence. I remember I was at the Vermont Studio Center and Chris Martin was the visiting artist and he did a studio visit with me. And he said, you know, your, your work is going along, uh, but I want you to think about um, how, how finished does a painting have to be? How, how um, you know, you're dotting all of these I's and crossing all these T's. And I think you should think about uh, how much you can leave open-ended. And um, I, I think about that still to this day all the time. And it's something that I, you know, the attitude, I, I can't remember who said it, Picasso or somebody said, uh, you know, to finish something is to kill it. And um, that is constantly going through my head um, when I'm painting or when I'm looking at a painting that I'm working on. And it's always a balance. It's always um, dicey as to, uh, you know, when to stop. Um, but, you know, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an amorphous thing. It's, it's uh, you know, you just try it. And, and sometimes, you, it, sometimes you hit it and sometimes you don't. Um, but those kind of things uh, influenced me a lot uh, in New York. I also just being able to see the incredible amount of artwork, uh, contemporary work that's going on in, in New York City and in and around New York um, is just an amazing, I think of it as an amazing gift. Um, you know, I grew up, as, as we said, in Memphis, Tennessee, um, which has, has a contemporary museum, a contemporary museum. And uh, one of the big shows there, I remember when I was in high school was painted duck decoys of the 18th century. And that's pretty, par for the course uh, for that area of the country. Um, so when I first got to New York and I could step out of my apartment and get on a subway and in you know, a half hour at the most, um, be looking at world-class, world-famous art, 
um, it's something that I never lost, that's never lost on me. And, uh, so, and I do miss it greatly. Um, there, are, there are wonderful things about being in Taos, um, as, as we talked about, um, but I still do miss the energy and the, uh, the, the friends, the community uh, that I had in New York. Um, luckily, Lauren's helping me build that community here. So thanks for, the, thanks for the question. Thanks, thanks, Paul, and thanks for that question. And thanks, yeah, thanks so much, Deborah. Um, I guess to that, you know, in appreciation of the love for New York City, which I share, of course, um, but I'm going to pivot to our question in the chat, which is a little bit different. And um, this question is from Dave, and it actually is asking, you know, has the nature of New Mexico stepped into your paintings? Is it seeping into your paintings in any way? Um, and so it's a nice pivot for us after uh, that last answer. So thanks, Dave. I don't know. When I first got here, when I first got here and got set up in a studio, <clears throat> almost, I don't know if it was a subconscious reaction to uh, what you always hear about New Mexico and New Mexico artists and what artists love about New Mexico. But I almost immediately started painting uh, what I called a gray series of paintings. Um, so there was no color, there was no light. Uh, the color, uh, what little there was, was very much grayed down, you know, mixed with their, their opposites. And um, I may be one of the only painters that I know that moved to New Mexico with this incredible light and space and, and the incredible blue sky and started painting uh, closer to a monochromatic palette. But um, I don't really think, I mean, I don't know. I don't know that I'm the greatest judge of whether, uh, whether it's influencing my work or not. I think, or if I am, I think it's gonna maybe take a little while for me to look back at the work and, and try to see if it has. Um, I don't necessarily at this moment think that it has seeped into my work. Um, I'm not really a, I'm not really that kind of painter. I'm not really, I don't, I'm not really um, inspired by an environment as far as making paintings go. Um, I'm more inspired by those things, those autobiographical things, uh, the things I'm reading, the things I'm looking at. Um, those kind of things than, uh, and, and looking at other art uh, than uh, I am about just a natural environment. I really don't like nature that much. I like the city um, and, uh, but I don't even, but that being said, I don't even really think that the city itself has influenced me, has influenced my work other than, like I said, being able to, having the access to other art and artists, having access to, to serious painters, serious artists, and and having being able to be in a dialogue uh, with them. So that's thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And that's an, you know that's a lot of what we're trying to accomplish with the Taos Abstract Artist Collective too, is to is to create spaces or to you know reignite spaces that have existed for a long time to community dialogues around abstraction. So we're very mm -hmm. Glad to have you for as long as you choose to stay in Taos. Um, I'm going to pop over to our next question here that's in the chat from Pamela, um, which is, you know, is there any advice that you would give to abstract painters, perhaps without formal training? You know, we're talking a bit about, you know, the the art school phenomenon, the unlearning or the relearning or however we want to contextualize that. Um, but there are a lot of artists and abstract artists working out there without formal training. Um, and any words that you could share to those folks? Well, I think I'll start off by saying, I think there is a place for formal training because I think it does expose you to, and, and it keeps you, that kind of formal training kind of keeps you from reinventing the wheel because, uh, you know, you may think you have a, brilliant idea and make a whole, base your whole output on that idea. And then you find out that somebody in Russia in 1921 was doing the exact same thing, only a lot, lot better. So, I mean, it does, it does help you in that way. Um, but, uh, so I don't think, I don't think, if you don't have that education, I think you have to give it to yourself, at least in art, his, art, his, art history education. You have to read, you have to find uh, books about painters you like and just keep reading and reading and reading. Before I went back to school, that's, that's what I did. I didn't know I was gonna go to art school. So, uh, but I was painting. And so I started showing, I had my first shows in Dallas and I started looking around at the other people that I was showing with and thinking, 
their work is a lot better than mine. And how can I accelerate that development? So the first thing I did was I went to the library and I didn't know a lot about art history. Uh, I, I think in high school that the creative and performing arts school I went to, they kind of stopped at Van Gogh. And so I, um, I went to the library, I would find, go to the art section, find books that I responded to the covers and check them out and read them. And then they would mention other artists and other movements and things like that in those books. And then I would go find books about them. I think it's imperative that you do something like that. I don't think it's imperative that you go to school, but I think it's imperative that you educate yourself. And, um, and then you can, you, can, you can find books, you know, you can find books for technique. Um, you can find books that tell you how to paint with acrylics and give you tips and, and things like that that you might respond to. But I think that the main thing is to, um, uh, you know, read read and look at work, go to museums, look at work. And then, you know, it kind of minimizes the need for formal education, I think. Thank you so much, Paul. And thanks for that question, Pamela. Um, are there other questions, other folks that would like to ask questions? Uh, yeah, Bob, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Well, first of all, thanks, Paul, for such a, an open and really generous interview. And thanks, Lauren. Uh, I thought it was really, uh, you covered a lot of territory that I've thought about over the years. Um, I'm sure we all have. One thing you talked about was the uh, supposed dichotomy between personal references and formal references. When I went to art school, formal references were supposed to be everything. It, the artwork was only supposed to be about itself it wasn't supposed to be about anything else. And I thought that was totally ridiculous. And not only ridiculous, but also impossible. Because I looked at, uh, you know, pick an artist, Barnett Newman, and I thought his work was about everything. It wasn't not about anything. And so it's something I've struggled with and thought about all through my work has been bringing things into it. And what I, I think a long time ago decided was I wanted to bring everything into it, everything that I've ever thought about or seen. And my studio reflects that. My studio has thousands of scraps of fabric and drawings and bones and skulls and paintings and other people's work, and all kinds of stuff. And that to me, like you said a while ago, that's all in there, even though the work may be very minimal, uh, but it's all in there. And I, I don't know, I was just thinking, I, I espouse that idea of bringing everything in. And like you, I don't know how it comes out or what it means or any of that, but it's, uh, uh, I, I, I welcome it. And uh, I, I think we all need to learn in our own way how to be the most of what we are and put that into the work. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, that's true. I think, um, or at least that's the way that I, that I uh, work as well. Um, I think, although I, although I do think it's harder than you would think to bring everything in. Uh, sure. You know, it's, uh, it, sometimes like I was saying in the interview, it's, it's easier with these limitations. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that is the goal. I mean, you, cause you, like I said, you want, you want the work to represent you as closely as it can to represent the artist as closely as it can. And so, um, and you're excited about all these things, right. That you're reading and looking at. And, and, uh, and so you want, you want, the, you hope those things will be, will be included. Um, one of the, I know Lauren, uh, is, uh, sometimes involved in uh, the Jung, Jungian kind of attitudes. And there's a, there's a teacher named Anne McCoy, a painter and a teacher in New York. Uh, she's very into that. I took a seminar not long ago, uh, organized by her and Chantal Powell in London. And uh, it was accessing the subconscious. And, um, you know, we read a lot about, uh, we, it introduced me to a lot of readings, a lot of ideas. And uh, so it gave me even, uh, even more uh, that I wanted to try to include in the work. But I think that's imperative because I think that's the only way that you can create uh, a personal, a personal body of work. It's, 
I mean, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess if you are painting, um, you know, like Bryce Martin's early work, where it's just like one color, one color. Um, I guess that does say something about, I don't know him, but I guess that does say something about Bryce Barton's personality. Um, but um, the work and the people that I'm attracted to um, are a lot more inclusive than that. Uh, the work that I'm attracted to is more inclusive than reductive. And um, that's just the way I think about it, you know. Thanks, Paul. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Mark has a question. Mark is also muted. <laughs> <laughs> All the best people hey are. Hey, Paul. Um, hi. Hey. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Mark. I'm Lauren's husband, so I'm in the same house as she is in Taos. Um, and so Paul is wondering what um, you're working on currently, what you have going on, and sort of um, are there, is there sort of like a uh, tour de force kind of project that you have always had in your mind or have in your mind something that um, a project that you look forward to tackling one day um, that um, I don't know either comports with what you're doing or is quite the opposite I don't know I don't really think of it I don't really think of my practice in terms of projects because um, like like Lauren and I were talking about in the interview I in the video I it it just kind of flows, I guess, the way it, want, it wants to flow. And um, so I don't really think about, um, I mean, I have, I have ideas about, like, I want to make a series of large work, or I want to make a series of, but I'm still dealing with that internal dialogue. So I don't think I really think of it in terms of projects. I do admire a lot of contemporary artists who they'll have an idea first, of something that they want to show or communicate and then they find the materials and the way that best suits that idea uh, that that best is best suited to bring that out um I, ju I just don't work that way i don't know that i could um but uh so no i don't really have any i don't really have any like big plans other than just to, to stay in the studio and keep painting and uh, keep my head down for a while and keep painting so thanks paul thanks mark um, maybe one final question in the group, if there is one from folks. And if not, we can. I don't think I see any hands there, but um, I did say we could we could potentially go to a quarter pass, but I don't think we will. We'll end a little bit shy, but I want to say a few things. First of all, just again, huge thank you to Paul and you know, love your your work, your body of work, and your process and practice, and for sharing a little bit more about that. So I mentioned this is um, maybe atypical for a studio visit artist talk. We really wanted to have a, for, if, a friendly, informal conversation to get a little bit beneath the, the work. That said, um, and I will put it in the chat, I do encourage all of you to go to Paul's website if you haven't already, um, and it's in the chat paulbanke.net and on Instagram, Paul Banky Paintings. And that would be great, you know, to keep track. Paul, you are a rather prolific, um, you know, I think promoter of, of work, whether it's your own work or other people's work, community work. And I so appreciate that. It's been lovely to be in community with you here in Taos for that reason. Um, I want to, so thank you, first of all, and maybe round of applause to Paul. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. It's been really wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. And I feel, the same way, I feel the same way about including in, uh, in the community with you. I, I feel like you did exactly the, exactly the same and it's, well, uh, it's refreshing and it's, it's great, uh, thanks, Paul. to be involved. On that note, we have other things in, lined up. So I want to invite everybody to tune in. So this is the very first tack talk that we've uh that we've endeavored to have but we have a fall series lined up we actually have i think we're booked through february at this point but i want to put the invitation out to folks of you if you're tuning in and you are a taos or surrounding area northern new mexico artist and you'd like to participate please email us at i will put that in the chat as well um taos abstract artist if i can talk and type at the same time collective at gmail um, you can send us a message 
We would love to have feedback or suggestions from anyone who participated today. Again, this is the first one around format, suggestions, anything that you have um, that would be wonderful. Um, and then so for you to know, in November, we'll have Danila Rumald in Albuquerque, and we'll be visiting her studio in the next couple of weeks and filming another conversation, um, then followed by Karen Tyson from Santa Fe. And then hopefully Susan Pascarelli, we can circle back around and I think we'll be hearing also from Bob Horline in the new year, which will be really exciting. We have a lot of folks that are interested and we, um, we wanna keep our conversations really alive and going. So um, again, feel free to email us. Please follow us on Taos Abstract Artist Collective on Instagram um, and Facebook. And I think that's everything. Again, we'll be posting potentially clips from today. This will be available in its full format for folks. If you're interested, email us, we'll send you a link, and then we will be including an archive of all of our TAC Talks on our website, which will be formally launched in February. So again, thanks to all of you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mark, for helping to make this happen. Um, and we look forward to the next go around. So have a uh, safe and happy Halloween. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome.